What's up squad? It's Brandon from the band Two Sun. Thank you so much for joining me today. One of the stories I really wanted to hop into was Operation Talisman Saber. So Talisman Saber is a joint military exercise primarily between the United States and Australia, which have been occurring roughly since 2005 every other year. So these operational exercises, they're always interesting because I think it's 50% gamesmanship uh, and 50% of actual uh, relationship development. And what do I mean by that? So 50% of gamesmanship. And so who is the enemy? Who are we preparing for? What is the operation around? What is the geographical terrain going to be? And Saber Talisman is going to be roughly, or excuse me, Talisman Saber is going to be roughly around defense of China. So... It's a game of show because well, I think there's an imminent uh, conflict with China. No, but I also know world peace doesn't sell fighter jets and missiles. And it's also an actuality. Usually who's attending these events and participating in them is a sign of growing and deepening relationships to comfort with each other, to trade military secrets and military protocol. And it speaks to a stronger relationship when you join in on these exercises together. So this year... Talisman Saber is the largest it's ever been. Over 30,000 troops or participating, participating people, as well as including 13 countries. So I had to know who those 13 was outside of the United States and Australia. So I'm looking for something interesting. You know, I'm always trying to find some juicy facts. So, and of course, this did not disappoint. So I'm scrolling through the list. U.S., Australia, no biggie, of course. Canada, it's always going to roll with the U.S. on a lot of things, especially military protocol. One of the U.S. closest partners. You have Japan, South Korea. Yeah, that's fair point. If, if it's uh, in around defense of Asia from possible Chinese conflict. You have your, your NATO guys. You got U.K., France. France has New Caledonia out there in uh, the... Southeast Asian, uh, spare more that Oceania area next to Australia. UK is going to be their top friend. Germany, this is their first time participating. Understood. It's a big NATO ally in the US. You got area regional players, Australia, um, New Zealand, uh, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, uh, Tonga. Uh, so all these people... Thanks, that's all fair in that region. Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Tonga, Papua New Guinea, right? PNG. And the one that really stuck out to me, though, was Indonesia. So for those that don't know, Indonesia is pretty much the, the gatekeeper of the Indo-Pacific region, right? It sits on, along that, across from Singapore, that critical straits of Malacca, which separates Indian Ocean trade from Pacific Ocean trade. It's the center of the Malay archipelago, the largest archipelago in the world. And it's the largest, most populous Muslim country in the world. It's about 270 million people. And it's, a, it's, it's breadth. It's large. Geographically, it's large. So the breadth, like east to west, island to island, takes up the same amount of space, even though it's an archipelago, as continental United States, as far as, as distance from east to west. So what, what I've seen is that U.S. has been kind of pushing the narrative, you know, this is the third largest democracy in the world, which is, is followed behind, um, following behind India and the United States, of course. But I really found this interesting because I always thought that Indonesia was a little bit more aligned to China in this region than it was for the United States. So I really want to dig in and see where did I possibly miss the boat on this relationship. It's never been uh, a full, fully committed member or a hoorah member of either camp. But I definitely thought it kind of linked 51 China, 49 uh, US. And, and digging deeper, you see that it's, it's a couple layers to this. Uh, and, and the reason it's going to deal with Indonesia's plans and where they're trying to, to go. So Indonesia... 270 million people, that's a lot of miles to feed. Now, the island itself, itself is a cornucopia of tropical goods. I mean, they, they produce oil, natural gas, 
rubber, palm oil. I remember I actually been to Indonesia. I went to Bali. And when I was in Indonesia, I remember my cab driver, he was talking about, we have everything it takes to make a car, but we don't make cars. So he was talking about the level of development, the resources there, they had an abundance of resources, but they didn't have the level of development uh, and infrastructure to be a major player in the global automobile export market. And I think that says a lot about this region because China has been a major investor there. A lot of investment, FDI foreign direct investment in the country to develop it, uh, to bring it along is coming from China. China is contributing far more to Indonesia economic development at this point of the game, the United States. So I was kind of shocked when I see that Indonesia kind of stepped aside of that relationship to pursue a relationship, especially when you know the United States is really trying to build that defensive sphere as kind of like an anti-China uh, alliance. But I think Indonesia has said, you know, an enemy afar, or let's say uh, a strong power afar is better than a strong power in the region. And I think this is coming from the relationship, particularly around the Natuna Regency, a cluster of about 150 islands, uh, the northern part of Indonesia, and only 80% of them aren't even inhabited. But there has been stories because it's all about the South, the Chinese and their South, South China Sea push and their claim for land. And a lot of people think, oh, well, that's in the military bases. Yes, they are doing this. But Indonesia in that, that area, in that Natuna Regency, is also drilling for gas and oil. This is very, very strategically important because if there was gas and oil found in this, this location, whoever holds that area, let's say it was China that held the area, China would now be able to basically have more energy east of the Malacca Straits, east of Singapore. And that's very important because it'd be more closer to their realm of control and they wouldn't have to go all the way to the Middle East to rely on their energy needs, at least not all of them. So I can see what our Chinese are very fevered, like very highly contesting this area to get that energy security. So Indonesia's not appreciating how China is handling business in the South China Seas, not appreciating the, the protests and relationship that they're trying to uh, protest against the Indonesia exploring this region for possible more resources that it can add to uh, its economy. And I, so it's the economic reasons why I think Indonesia is aligning with the, the U.S. And I also think it's is deeper towards a development purpose. So it's the security side and the economic side. So Indonesia, when President Joko Widodo, who's the current president of Indonesia, first got in office around 2014, we looked at his travel trips. About 2014 and 2018, he was going to China for one reason or another every year. Since then, he's only been to China once. And what has filled his calendar up as far as foreign trips is going places such as Australia, Japan, and especially Singapore. And this is really interesting because it shows he's been working on developing these relationships that's going to be complementary to what he has in his camp. Indonesia is a young nation, a big population that's going to need jobs. China is a big population as well that's going to need jobs. So what is President Wadodo go doing? He go into countries with older Asian popularity uh, populations that has more technology or more superior level technology and more capital investments with the Asian population that doesn't consume as much. So it's actually a complementary relationship because he can get the tech and capital from these bigger nations while investing in the youth of his nations and, and getting them fed. So there was actually a poll that came out from the Lowy Institute between 2011, it was done in 2011 and 2021. And at the time in 2011, when I asked who was the biggest threat to Indonesia over the next decade, in 2011, that answer was Malaysia. In 2021, that answer was China. So between the military threat of China, the protestations of the drilling in the Regency, uh, the Natuna Regency, and then the seeking of capital enrichments for Indonesia, Indonesia is you can see how it's starting to lean towards the, the Western alliance of things or the U.S. Uh, 
the U.S. group, as, as you would say. Another point to call out as far as how hungry the Indonesians are for development is they're moving their capital. So their capital is, their capital city is Jakarta on Java, the island of Java. Java. They're actually going to be moving their capital uh, to a place called Nusantara, which is going to be on Borneo Island. So it's supposed to be this new, like uh, basically a paradise in the tropics. Borneo is going to be shared with Brunei and Malaysia, but it's a massive island. And it's relatively not that developed. So it's, it's ample room, resources to host a, a capital city. And Indonesia is going to make this city their display to the world of their level of development and economic attainment that they have. It's going to be like their whole city. And it's a great move because it's more centrally located as well than Jakarta. So when you start putting all these things together, we are really starting to see a, a change in, of, a slight change in of directions. Now, Indonesia had had some a very contentious history, whether you're talking about the anti-communist purge in 1960, which bordered on ethnic genocide against uh, overseas Chinese, or if you talk about the invasion of East Timor in the 70s, which lasted 25 years, wasn't even over until the late 1990s, where there was mass, another, what some consider a form of, of, of genocide, as well as uh, vandalism on a mass scale, uh, as East Timor was trying to break free of, of Indonesian's rule. So even though you, they have this kind of, uh, this hardline history, which basically were considered human rights violations, it seems as though the West is in a position to really want them in their account because they're such a vital country, and they're in, in a position to want to be in that account. Now, as a takeaway, these two things I found were, were really interesting. One, China's also going to be holding a military exercise later this year called Aman Yuyi. Now, in that military exercise, it's going to be countries such as Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And they're going to be basically... Oh, in Malaysia. I don't want to think of Malaysia in that group. So Laos, Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam. And if you can see on the map, one thing you can take away is the splitting of Asia. So Thailand, Singapore, and the Philippines are observers and talisman savers. They're not participants. But you can you can see that that strategy of China wanting to keep America feet wet on an outlying island well, is working because American bases, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines. But now it's getting closer with Indonesia, which kind of right in the gut of China's supply lines. So that being the case, China's going to be ever more reliant on the, the peninsula of Southeast Asian nations, such as Laos, Cambodia. Uh, they have sketchy history with Vietnam. But countries like Myanmar is going to be really important because when you think about supply chains, if there was an issue where China couldn't rely on the Malacca Straits, it's going to put stress to get their goods from either Central Asia, from the Middle East through Central Asia, through pipelines, and that's going to be hazardous because it's going to go through so many countries, a lot of hostile territory, or via the Andaman Sea through Mir and Bay of Begal, such through countries such as uh, Myanmar or Southwest China and, and that, uh, that's Indian territory when you start to get into Bay of Bengal. You have Bangladesh there, but as Bangladesh is gonna be surrounded by India as well. So it really stresses China capacity to get their, their resources with this, this group with Indonesia siding with the US. And it's also the situation of splitting Asia. Like, will like, you start to see a partition in Asia between these, these land countries and these sea countries around their alliances. Uh, ASEAN, 600 million people, to me, one of the most successful groupings of nations, so like a political grouping of Southeast Asian nations, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So it's really going to be interesting to see how that, that character, uh, those relationships develop with this, this China-US contingent. So we're still going to be on the lookout for it, but I have got you guys know how things were heating up in Southeast Asia right now. And wow, I was really shocked to see what Indonesia, the moves Indonesia Indonesia has been making and the point of direction they're looking to take their country over the coming decades. So 
Let me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear from you. Comment below, like, share, subscribe if you enjoy the content. Until next time, take care. Bantu up.